All right, hi, my name is Ben Alul, architect and owner of Kringle Flat. Kringle Flat was built in 1951 in Turak, Melbourne on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. The heritage listed flats were designed by architect JW Ribbit and consist of three buildings, the Crescent, the Tower and the Garage. The flats were built in off-form concrete. They have large glazed windows, cantilevered balconies and open stairs. A sky bridge links the roof of the Crescent to the Tower the form has been said to reference a ship. The heritage citation highlights the unusual form and siding alongside the extensive use of glass, steel and concrete as to why Karingal Flats is an individually significant example of early modernism in Melbourne. Notable owners include famed German fashion photographer Helmut Newton. The building has fallen into a state of disrepair with the striking coral and blue colour scheme being painted over in a beige stipple paint. Over time, this non-breathable paint began to suffocate the building, causing concrete cancer. When I purchased the flat in 2016, I joined the Owners Corporation. Working closely with heritage architect Nigel Lewis, we advocated for not only the urgent repair of the building, but also to restore the building back to its former colour scheme. Five years later, the restoration works to the facade are complete. During these restoration works, we began to renovate our flat. As an architect's own home, the project was afforded the freedom to push design boundaries. It sought to reverse years of neglect and unsympathetic alterations by restoring original details and undertaking a series of clearly defined interventions to organise space. Design cues were taken from the existing heritage fabric. The flat is home to my partner, Jen, and our Italian Greyhound, Vinnie. The project was built by me and my dad, a teacher on long service leave, alongside help from countless family and friends. Whilst the initial concept remained to the end, being both architect and builder allowed flexibility to refine the design as opportunities arose on site. Many details were sketched and workshopped over tea breaks prior to fabrication. The project is located within the tower building. There's only one 58 metre square flat per floor, ensuring each flat has four aspects with floor to ceiling glazing overlooking Melbourne skyline. The original layout was a series of individual rooms. Over time, cabinetry was added to these spaces in an ad hoc manner. The bathroom layout was inefficient and disproportionately large compared to the rest of the space. Existing doors were removed and openings maximised to, to the extent of the structural grid. These new openings were neatly capped with fine steel shrouds. A new unified timber floor runs through frame thresholds, drawing the iron to the rooms beyond, creating a layering of spaces. The existing front door between the lobby and living was removed to open up views to the previously hidden Swedish church. In order to fit the brief within the footprint, the existing bathroom and kitchen layouts were reworked. The bathroom was condensed to allow a service zone for laundry, hot water service and storage. This layout was thoroughly interrogated in plan and section, working between existing structure, windows and pipe locations. The simple appearance belies the complicated stacking of programs. The floor of the bathroom was uniformly raised to accommodate the new layout. The existing steel window was carefully divided along its frame to reduce the opening by a third internally, whilst maintaining the appearance from the outside. A freestanding joinery unit divides the bedroom from the living area, providing much needed storage to both spaces. The unit is elevated on legs and held off the ceiling to maintain a sense of space while providing privacy. Where possible, heritage details were retained and restored or replaced if required. Original hard plaster damaged by years of unsympath unsympathetic additions were carefully restored. The gentle radiuses on the edge of the beams were reinstated when missing. Stipple paint was removed with a peel away system. Layers of mismatched flooring were removed. The cork tiles were incredibly stubborn. The slab was leveled and a Tasmanian oak floor was installed. All two tons of timber board and plus substrate had to be manhandled up 61 stairs over a weekend. Alongside era appropriate white mosaics, terrazzo was picked with an aggregate that referenced the coral on the facade to be used consistently across the space. Newly selected materials like Tasmanian oak and terrazzo were sympathetic to Rivet's original design intent. The steel frame windows were sealed shut over time. These were carefully restored and made operational again. Broken glass was repaired, frames repainted and faulty winders replaced with era appropriate stays. Years of paint were stripped off original door hardware and buckets of coke prior to them being reinstated. In order to bring the services up to code, the flat had to be completely rewired. Given the existing skirting had to be removed to lay the floor, there was an opportunity to preserve as much of the original plaster as possible by running the new wiring in this exposed cavity. New taller skirting was fabricated by us to cover these openings. The profile of the original skirt was matched. New interventions were uniformly black. 
in contrast to the original fabric of the flat, clearly defining them as new work. On paper, new punched openings and joinery aligned to a single datum. After demolition, it dawned on us that it was not possible and the entire building was out of plumb and structural beams at all different depths. Revised details scribbled on walls rationalised the design, ensuring every piece was going to be different to achieve those consistent datums. Templates were made for each piece prior to them being laser cut. Joinery was detailed to be minimal freestanding pieces held off the floor and ceiling. The steel frames were shop drawn by me, welded off site by my dad and uncle before being powder coated and installed. Custom benches, bedside tables and a dining table were designed and fabricated by us to ensure consistency throughout. Featherston scape dining chairs found in a scrap heap were also restored, perfectly complementing the flat. Even the linen shears were sewn by mum over a long weekend. The underutilised north facing garage was adapted into a flexible room, adding 12 square metres of floor area. Easily switching between uses home office, living room and gym, the separately zoned space was invaluable throughout the pandemic. The existing garage door was retained, but modified to increase head clearance, concealing a pivot window beyond. When occupied, it provides an opportunity to engage with other residents, activating an otherwise underused car park. Many chats have been had in the doorway. Since moving into the flat in July, we have lived through another lockdown, celebrated Christmas, survived a heat wave and had a 30th birthday for 14 in the living room. The flexible space downstairs has been used as a gym in the mornings, a study during the day and a second living room on weekends. Vinnie, our greyhound, has the run of the flat and even though he's his own architect designed bedroom, he spends the day following the sun, using our bed in the morning and the sofa in the afternoon. Living in the flat is often perceived as a compromise. The outcome shows through careful restoration and considered intervention, heritage housing stock can be updated to provide a platform for modern living in a sustainable manner. The adaptive reuse of underutilized outbuildings can not only increase value and livability, but also foster a sense of community by activating these spaces. Okay. Encouraging others to invest in this typology not only protects the heritage fabric of our city, but also can ease the burden of urban sprawl given their inner city locale. Thank you.